Hello everybody, and how are you today? Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. Oh, and me? Oh, I'm still above ground and breathing. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> now, according to my calendar, I've now been under house arrest for 57 weeks. Imagine that, one year and five weeks. And when will I get my second vaccination, you ask? Well, sometime in June, if they don't forget about me again. And that means, let me think, yes, that means that by the end of June, I should be free to move about once again. Imagine that, being able to go beyond the confines of my little house and garden here. But I've not been idle. I have been very busy working out all the intricacies of wide view and wide traffic these past weeks. Now to explain. These two programs join a number of computers together. Now on my system, the server computer is called Flight One and that runs the actual hardware cockpit. The client computer is called Flight Two and it runs the three external screens. WideView transmits all the movement, time and spatial location of aircraft from Flight 1, the server, to Flight 2, the client. Now I'd managed to get that running fairly quickly as it worked pretty much right out of the box. But wide traffic is quite different, as it has to synchronize all the AI aircraft traffic between Flight 1 and Flight 2. And that means a lot of data has to pass between the two computers. If the connection between the two computers is slow, then the aircraft will behave very erratically. So, when an aircraft is seen Taking off on Flight 1, it will be seen exactly on the external view screens of Flight 2. And it's the same for a jet landing as well as for all those en route aircraft that one encounters. So, when ATC on Flight 1 computer says, I am number 2 to take off, then there will actually be another aircraft visible in front of me on the computer screens of Flight 2. That is what Wide View does, and Wide Traffic. Now remember that ATC control is only on Flight 1, the server, but all the aircraft have to show on Flight 2, the external view. You following all of this? <laughs> oh, and there's another thing to remember. This only works with AI traffic, artificial intelligence. Any aircraft that is just a graphic object, like a static permanently parked aeroplane, that is not transmitted from the server to the client. And all those annoying kamikaze ground vehicles that like to use me for target practice while I'm taxiing are also simply graphic images and not AI, artificial intelligent objects. Here's an example of one of those kamikaze vehicles looking for some unsuspecting victim to run into. Only AI intelligent objects are transmitted from one to the other. And in this case, that means all the aircraft that is loaded into your system. Now I'm going to show you my settings in a little bit, but first let me show you 
how it works now that I've been finishing tweaking up. Here I am at stand B46 at Terminal 4 at LAX. You can see all the airport here. And there is Ryanair 186. Over here are a number of red text lines to indicate other aircraft in the area. These are all AI aircraft generated by P3D and they're all generated and created from the aircraft that you have in the Sim Objects folder in P3D. Here's one getting ready to take off. By the way, my frame rate here is quite good as well. Here I'm showing 25 to 26 frames per second. And remember that this is a very detailed airport scenery. And I'm also running Active Sky and some additional programs as well. You can see there's a lot of other aircraft over there at the other terminal building, as the red text indicates. Now this is a small screen on Flight 1, the server, showing Orion Air 186 from a spot view. And there is a jet getting ready to take off. Let's see if it also shows on Flight 2, the client computer. Ah yes, there it goes. Now here is a jet coming in to land on the small Flight 1 screen. And it too shows in perfect synchronization on the external view Flight 2 computer. But you know it took a lot of experimenting and trial and error to get it to work. I also have to acknowledge the patient assistance of Mr. Luciano Napolitano who designed and wrote the wide view and wide traffic programs. Every system will be different, so it was impossible for him to write a user manual that had every possible scenario and solution written in it. The manual can only be a basic one, sufficient to get a person up and running but with a few tips and tricks to fine-tune a system to make it work smoothly. So, I hope you are watching Mr. Napolitano because this is what your patience with me has made possible. Thank you. I'd managed to get WideView working very well, as my recent online videos show, but adding wide traffic presented some challenges. Initially, you see, I was using only one LAN port on each computer. Now, it's a gigabit Ethernet port and connection, but there was so much data being transmitted between the two computers that neither wide view nor wide traffic worked well at all. This illustration shows that system. Here you can see what my basic setup was like. My router with its access to the internet is at the upper right. There is an ethernet cable running from the router to a simple network gigabit hub switch. Flight 1 and Flight 2 computers are connected to this hub via a standard Category 5 Ethernet cable. Networks operate on what is called packet technology. Data is broken down into small packets of information which is then sent from a source computer over a network to the destination computer where it is reassembled and after being checked and verified it then does what it's supposed to do. So if a data packet showing my location and the view around me was delayed by some huge packets of data from another program, well then, I could be taking off on a runway when the data showing a building caught up with me. And believe it or not, that's exactly what happened. 
The traffic was so high that it was causing a traffic jam in the hub. And you all know how traffic moves on the highway when there's a traffic jam. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> the way to deal with this slowness is to activate a second LAN port on each computer. Now in motoring terms that would be to provide an alternate route or some additional lanes to handle the extra traffic. It just so happened that my two computers came with two LAN ports each, and each were gigabit. But if you've only got one on your motherboard, then buying an expansion card to plug into a spare PCIe slot is a simple enough solution. That way, one LAN port can be dedicated to transmitting wide view data, and in my case, all the active sky weather data as well, and the second LAN port can be dedicated to run the wide traffic data streams. Mr. Napolitano actually foresaw this when he designed these programs, and he ensured that the settings for both wide view and wide traffic would allow for a specific IP address to be entered into it to ensure that data transmission could be dedicated to a specific IP destination. That way, wide view transmits on one IP and wide traffic can transmit on another. That is what this next illustration shows. The internet router is at the upper right, but now the gigabit hub has two additional connections plugged into it. This makes an immediate improvement but there were still some lags in the data streams as everything was having to be exchanged and routed through the one single hub switch you see here. That single hub became a bottleneck, causing a traffic jam. So my solution was to get a second hub and use the first hub for wide view and active sky and the second hub for the higher data traffic needed for wide traffic. Now, for those of you who are savvy with such things, you will know that each LAN port must have its own unique IP address. IP stands for Internet Protocol, by the way. And the IP address has to be either manually assigned or be dynamically assigned by a DHCP server. A DHCP server is a network server that automatically provides and assigns IP addresses, default gateways and other network parameters to client devices. It relies on the standard protocol known as Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP, to respond to broadcast queries by clients. The DHCP server on my network system is on the main internet router. The second LAN ports are not connected to this router, so I assigned internal IPs to the second LAN ports. But while everything else on the computer would recognize the new internal IP addresses and transmit data between them, neither wide view nor wide traffic would. And so it was back to the drawing board. The only way I discovered to get around this issue was to connect a second hub to the DHCP server on the router and then have it assign internal IP addresses automatically as this illustration shows. And this worked with both wide view and wide traffic. And since the second hub is a smart and managed hub, the data flow can be handled very nicely. So I have internet connection for internet software updates and for active sky weather and transmission of wide view data on LAN 1 on each computer. But all the really heavy data traffic is now confined to the second LAN port on each computer using the programmable gigabit 
network switch. And that gave me the network speed I needed to keep the two computers synchronized. All right, now it's time to show you what my settings are. And if Mr. Napolitano is watching, then please be good enough to check them out and let me know if you can see a better way or better options. So let's start with the client, or Flight 2, as I've named that computer. This is the computer that runs the three large external view screens. Now these are the setting screens in P3D. This first one is the first screen, the application. Now I've only got two boxes ticked in this, as you can see. Next, the information screen. I've disabled all the vehicle labels, but I have only a tick in the primary info box to show me frame rates. Nothing else is selected on this screen. And on this third screen, the sound, as I've disabled all sound for flight two. That's because all the sound is coming from flight one, as I'll show you in a moment. This screen, the traffic screen is important. All aircraft traffic is disabled, as is the general aviation option. That's because all aircraft is being generated and transmitted from Flight 1, the server. This screen, the realism screen, is also very important. Notice that all the settings on the client are disabled. That's because the server provides all the control for the aircraft. I also ignore crashes and avatar collision. <laughs> the kamikaze vehicles otherwise, you know, you could end up with a standoff. The fuel on the client is unlimited as again that is controlled by the server. In the display screen, I've activated the high resolution settings. But the V-Sync is on with target frame set to 50, as that is the frame rate of the cameras I use to record the cockpit during a flight. Now here is a big item, the world screen. Remember that the client is showing outside views only, so I want the best graphics that I can get. I could probably tweak this some more to get better views, but this is working for me at the moment. You will notice that I've not activated enhanced atmospherics. That's because I'm using Active Sky for the weather generation, and that's to avoid any possible conflict. Now, you may want to have your own settings according to the equipment that you have. On the lighting panel, I've opted for just dynamic lighting and the landing lights. The shadow quality is also minimal. I'm still experimenting with these settings, so nothing is final yet. Now let's have a look at the server, which I named Flight 1. The first screen is just like the client screen, except that I show a scenario startup option. That's because the server controls everything, location, position, but most of all, I need to be able to select PMDG manually. As those of you who use PMDG know that there are issues if you make PMDG the default aircraft. It can crash PMD P3D. The next screen on the server looks more normal. I use ATC and I need a pilot's voice activated on the server, as that is where the sound comes from. And here is the sound screen with everything activated and set. The server is the cockpit and produces the sound. The client has no need to produce any sound at all. Now this screen is important. The traffic is set here. 
wide traffic will generate all the aircraft and then send that information to the client. I do not need airport vehicles to show on the server so they are disabled. The realism screen is also fully activated and the complete opposite of that of the client. I still opt to have crashes ignored however. Besides, I never crash. I am a good pilot. Honest. <laughs> the display settings for the server are minimal as only the items that are displayed are the instrument panels. I don't need any external views on the server other than the bare minimum. So here on the world screen you can see I have disabled everything that is not needed and thus I freed up all the resources I can for other functions. The same goes for the lighting panel here. And by the way, when I activate the lights on the server, yes, they do appear on the ground on the client. Now those are the settings for P3D. Now let's have a look at the settings screens for wide view and wide traffic. Here is the wide view settings screen for the client, Flight 2. You will notice that I have set a highest priority for the client and I've activated the IntelliSmooth option. Over here you can see that it is the client option that is selected. Now, I opted selected all the cores here as an experiment. I don't know whether it's going to make a difference, but this is just an experiment. All the other settings on this screen are the default settings and right out of the box. Since I use Active Sky on both the server and the client computers, I disabled the weather options in order to free up resources. This is something, by the way, that Mr. Napolitano approved of. Now the wide traffic options are also the default for the client and just as it appeared when I installed the program on Flight 2. I've made no changes whatsoever to the default. Now over to the server. These are the settings for wide view. Everything is default right out of the box except for two options. First, I activated the highest priority option. And second, most importantly, I added the IP address for the client in this little box. 10.0.0.6. Here's a close-up showing the address. That is the address of LAN 1 on the client computer, Flight 2. So this way I can focus and direct traffic across the network to that specific port and avoid any collisions and bottlenecks. As you can see from this screen, I disabled the weather program on the server just as I did on the client because Active Sky is being used. Here's a close up. Now, the wide traffic settings on the server are also default and right out of the box with two exceptions. One is that I've disabled the option to synchronize vehicles and other traffic. I have no programs running smart airport vehicles, so there are no AI airport objects to transmit to the client. So disabling this will also free up some resources. The other thing I did was to specify the destination address for wide traffic to use. And here you can see it. 10.0.0.105. 
That's the IP address of LAN 2 on the client or the Flight 2 computer. So that's what I've been doing these past few weeks, tweaking and experimenting with wide view and white traffic and getting everything to work. It took quite a bit of time to work out the problems and you know communication with Mr. Napolitano also takes time. He told me he could fix things in a second if he was sitting in front of my computer, but it's a little tricky since he's in Italy and I'm here in England. So I'm limited to having to write detailed reports in email exchanges. What's that? Oh, I can hear you asking, does it work on an actual flight using ATC and an IFR flight plan with all the flight following that goes with that? <coughs> Well, let's find out, shall we? Let's make a proper escape flight and let's use two very busy airports to put it through its paces. How's that? Will that do? Now, I've got to thank Tony S for the suggestion for this flight. He requested me to fly between KLAX Los Angeles and KLAS Las Vegas. In case you want to know, that's called the Casino Run. <laughs> I checked and found out that American Airlines makes a regular run between KLAX and KLAS. It is flight AA2479. So that's what I'm going to follow. I discovered they use Terminal 4 and I've picked gate B46 for my departure gate. Now I've got everything ready. The passengers are all on board and we are ready to push back and start the engines. So, do you feel lucky? Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> right then. Let's get ourselves in the cockpit of Ryanair and fly to Las Vegas. Okay, come on in, take your seat. We've been given our clearance, our IFR clearance, to go from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. So, if you're feeling lucky, ha, we'll be there in a very short time. Now, Everything's been set up, we're all fueled, we've got our IFR clearance, we are ready to do a push back and start. We're cleared to taxi to runway 25 right and we will be taking the Orca 5 departure. Then we are cleared to an altitude of 10,000 feet flying at the runway heading and then they'll take over at that and have us go wherever it is they want us to go always expediting this and expediting that I'm just looking around I'm very nervous there's got to be a few kamikaze vehicles waiting to use me for target practice oh well here we go then Right, we're all set. So, crew ready? We're going to do a pushback and start on engine number one. And we're also going to turn our nose to the right, our tail to the left, because we want to go down in that direction. So, here we go then. Adjust the seat. Make sure everything is ready and we will contact cockpit to ground. Go ahead. We've been cleared for pushback and start. They want the tail to our left. Roger that. Ready for pushback. Tail to the left. Ready parking brake, please. Okay. Parking brake off. Air conditioning is Brakes off. Released. 
switching to generator one and we will start up as soon as we get the pushback going. Congratulations, here we go. All right, starting engine number one. Start valve has opened. We're looking for 24 on the end two. So far so good out there. And here we are. 24 introduce the fuel. And we'll be looking for 115 volts coming from engine number one on the indicator here. Okay. Ah, yes, the engines have kicked in. Okay, starting engine number two, and there's 115 volts. Star valve has opened on engine two. Parking brake is set. Brake set. Introduce the fuel. Kamikaze is there anywhere? Watch for the slip release of that center right now. Thank you, Roger. Everybody's name is Roger on the ground. Have you ever noticed that? Ah, oh well. Here we go. We've got ignition. Engines are winding up. We have 115 volts on engine number two. Very good. Right, we will now switch over to the main engines and turn on the air conditioning, turn off the APU bleed and turn off the APU. Good, we're now set to do a taxi. And we have to go down that way. So, flaps of five. Hold very tight please, everything is set up on here. And we will verify the takeoff speeds, it's 147 now, okay? Right, here we go then. Break off. There's a, a jet coming in to land. So, a little bit of power to get ourselves unstuck.
all looking to break the bank in Las Vegas. We've got just over five tons of fuel. Look at that, there it goes. Five tons of fuel for the trip. It should be about 45 minutes airtime once we get airborne. The weather is a little murky. The prognosis says that we will be coming in to land at runway one left. So I've set everything up for a landing at one left, but that could change. And we have to go all the way to the end of this taxiway. Now there's plenty of aircraft parked here. So, wide traffic is working very well. So, Mr. Napolitano, if you're listening and watching, thank you. Thank you for the brilliant bits of coding that you did to produce this program that makes it work so well. on the external screens is 19. This is a very dense airport. Very dense. High graphics and everything else. It's very detailed. Mr. Napolitano, if you could figure out a way how to get rid of all of those kamikaze vehicles and have them act more intelligently, <laughs> that would be a good plus. Okay, everything seems to be okay. checklist and take off briefing is complete engine bleeds are on cabin start switches continuous Check, 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 everything is good, check, attendance. 
decision height at Las Vegas is 284 feet. So I have that set in the radio altimeter. The final approach course is 014 for the landing, presuming that it is going to be still at uh, runway 1 left. seem to be on course and we're climbing over the tops of the mountains it'll be interesting to see if on this flight we get all of those um, traffic at so and so you know report them in sight etc so we'll have to uh, see how that works out on a previous test flight I did, there was a lot of that.
a nice view.
straight onto runway one left. Five point zero two five four. 
clear to land, good to land. 200. 200, check. 100. 50, 40, 30, 90, 10. And we are touched down. Reverse thrust applied. Gentlemen. 
gentlemen, please remain seated and buckled in your seat. We have a little ways to go before we get to the gate. But everybody ignores that, don't they? They're in a mad rush to get their bags full of all of that cash that they want to give to Las Vegas casinos. <laughs> They're all feeling very lucky. Here we're coming up to Sierra. Yeah, this is Sierra, so we will be going left here onto Golf. There's goes. That's traffic. It's showing on here. It's showing on the screen, the traffic. That was what I needed to have it do. I needed it to show on the screen. So here's golf to the left. Let me stick my hand out. Yep, turn left here. Las Vegas ground, orbit 
Charlie one four. Switching to the APU. And engines are shutting down. complete. Welcome to Las Vegas. Do you feel lucky? Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Ha! Huh. Well, I hope so. Lots of traffic, all perfectly coordinated. None of the traffic that we saw on this computer, the client, was generated by the program. It was all generated on the server and then transmitted to the client. So that's how the synchronization works. <clears throat> so, Mr. Napolitano, once again, thank you very much for making such a great program. If you can see anything that I can do to make improvements, please let me know. And for everyone else, enjoy your time in Las Vegas. I hope Lady Luck is on your side. Bye.